Hi all. In this video, we're going to discuss returns to buying winners and selling losers, implications for stock market efficiency by Jagadish and Titman, 1993. This is one of the top 15 most cited finance papers. First, what is the research question? So over the past recent years, many studies surrounding contrarian strategies, which is the act of buying past losers and selling past winners, have received a lot of attention. From Dubon and Thaler, 1985-1987, and Jagadish and Lehman, 1990s papers, it is further demonstrated that stock prices overreact to information and contrarian strategies tend to achieve abnormal returns. However, many of these studies neglected that these strategies may be a result of lack of liquidity in the market rather than an overreaction. Jagadish and Tipman, 1983, discovered that despite the focus on contrarian rather than other trading rules, such as relative strength, some practitioners still use relative strength as their stock selection criteria. The success of many mutual funds and the predictive power of value line ranking may suggest that relative strength strategies can generate abnormal returns. The goal of this paper is to analyze relative strength trading strategies. The author then identified two possibilities in their attempt to justify the success of value line rankings, along with mutual funds that use relative strength trading rules, while academic literature suggests the opposite strategy generates abnormal returns. Number one, practitioners realize that abnormal returns are either spurious or are unrelated to the tendencies to bypass winners. A discrepancy in the abnormal return is due to the difference between time horizons used in trading rules. Jagadish and Tipman, 1993, developed a series of tests that allowed them to evaluate their relative importance. The results indicated that the profits are not due to systemic, systematic risk of trading strategies and that predictable price changes that occur during three to 12 month holding periods may not be permanent. Their analysis of stock returns around earnings announcements dates suggest a similar bias in market expectations. And so what does the past literature say? So in the paper written by Debon Thaler in 1985, 1987, the concept of individuals overreacting to information was directly extended to suggest that contrarian strategies would achieve abnormal results. In more recent papers, Jagadish and Lehman, Lehman, 1990, provided more evidence on shorter-term return reversals, which demonstrated that contrarian strategies that select stocks based on returns from the previous weeks last month would generate more abnormal returns. However, these transaction strategies are intensive and based on short-term price movements. Lowe and McKinley, 1990, argued that abnormal returns are attributable to delayed stock price reactions rather than overreaction. However, despite the current academic literature, primarily focused on contrarian rather than relative strength trading. So some authors still use relative strength as their stock selection criteria. A majority of mutual funds examined by Grinblatt and Titman, 1989 and 1991, demonstrated a tendency to purchase stocks that increased in price compared to the previous quarter. So why is this research question important? While much academic literature focused on the contrarian strategy, the success of value line rankings in mutual funds suggested that the use of relative strength rules generate abnormal returns as opposed to the opposite strategy. This research paper provides insight into relative strength strategies. What data is used? The data used in the first several sections included all stocks with available return data in the specified months before portfolio formation over the 1965 to 1989 period. Return data were obtained from the CRISP daily returns file. So now let's look at Table 1. Table 1 shows the average returns of different buy and sell portfolios, including the zero cost for the 32 strategies listed previously. All of the returns were statistically significant other than a three-month strategy that didn't skip a week. The relative strength portfolios are formed based on J-month lag returns and held for K-months. J and K are values for the different strategies indicated in the first column in a row. The stocks in the most successful zero-cost strategy were selected based on their returns over the first 12 months, and the portfolio was held for three months. The strategy yielded 1.31% per month, as shown in panel A, and 1.49% per month, as shown in panel B. The holding period returns are slightly higher in panel B than panel A. Overall, this table establishes that the relative strength strategies are profitable on average. Panel A demonstrates the holding period returns, which are higher when the formation and holding periods are contagious. Panel B shows returns when there is a one-week lag between formation period and holding period. The sample period is from January 1965 to December 1989. So now let's look at slide two, or sorry, table two. 
Table 2 shows the betas and market capitalizations of relative strength portfolios. As mentioned in the previous section, the relative strength strategy served as a foundation for other strategies, among which the six-month six month strategy was explored. Table 2 reports the estimate of the two most common indicators. The sample period is January 1965 to December 1989. Some trends are that beta values are higher for extreme past return portfolios, and the extreme past return portfolios also have lower market capitalization than average. The beta of the zero cost winners minus losers portfolio is negative as the beta of the portfolio of past losers is higher than the beta of the portfolio of past winners. The equally weighted portfolio of stocks in the lowest past return decile is the portfolio P1. Equally weighted portfolio in the next decile is in P2, etc. The betas with respect to the valuated index, as well as the average market capitalization of the stocks, are also reported here. Jagadish and Tipman 1989 also examined whether relative strength profits can arise from a lead lag relationship, as studied in Lowe and McKinley. Jagadish and Tipman postulated that if the lead lag effect is an important source of relative strength profits, then the profit will depend on the magnitude of factor portfolio return in the previous period. So now let's, let's look at Table 3. So in Table 3, we're discussing returns of size-based and beta-based relatives, relative strength portfolios. Table 3 reports the returns of the six-month, six-month strategy for various subsamples. The strategy was implemented on three size-based subsamples, S1 small, S2 medium, and S3 large, and three beta-based subsamples, beta 1 low, beta 2 medium, and beta 3 high. Panel A shows that the returns were similar when applied to the entire stock sample in different subsamples. However, in P10 minus P1 group, size was somewhat negatively correlated with returns, and beta was somewhat positively correlated with returns. The overall similarity between the returns suggests that the relative strength profits were not primarily due to the cross-sectional differences in the systematic risk of the stock and sample. Panel B, which reports the risk-adjusted returns, has similar implications. So now we're going to look at Table 4. In Table 4, we're looking at the returns on size-based relative strength portfolios by calendar months. When testing for possible seasonal effects in the performance of the relative strength portfolios, Jagadish and Tittman expect that the relative strength strategies will not be successful in the month of January based on Rule 1983. Table 4 reports the average return of zero-cost portfolios to each calendar month. The relative strength portfolios are formed based on six-month lag returns and held for six months. Stocks are ranked in ascending order on the basis of six-month lag returns, as well as the equally weighted portfolio of stocks. Sample S1 contains small firms, S2 contains medium-sized firms, etc. Returns were negative in January and mostly positive in the other 11 months. That's supporting the aforementioned expectation. In addition, there was a seasonal pattern outside of January. Returns were low in August and were high in April, November, and December. The authors noted that April had consistently positive returns. They proposed that this trend could be attributed to the fact that corporations must transfer money to the pension funds prior, prior to April 15th in order to qualify for a tax deduction in the previous year. Winner's portfolio may benefit from additional price pressure in this month if these pension fund assets are primarily invested by portfolio managers who follow you relative strength rules. Okay, so now we're going to go to slide five, or sorry, table five. Returns of sized, um, sorry, um, re, sorry, this is table six. Returns of size based relative strength portfolios, sub period analysis. Table six reports the returns of the six month, six month zero cost strategy in each of the first five years periods in the 1965 to 1989 sample period. The strategy, which was implemented on the entire sample of stocks, produced average returns that are positive in all but one time period from 1975 to 1979. Further analysis of the strategy applied to size-based subsamples indicates that negative returns are primarily due to negative returns of small firms in January. The returns are positive when the strategy was implemented on subsamples of large and medium-sized firms. Additionally, returns were positive across the board when January was excluded. Anyway, so that concludes uh, the Jagadish and Tipman 1993 video. I hope you found this helpful, and I'll see you in the next video. If you have any questions about this video, please post your questions or comments in the comment section below. Thanks so much. See you soon.